it's all Nathaniel Wyeth's fault. You may, perhaps, have heard of his brother, the painter Andrew Wyeth who is far more likely to pop up in our university challenge question than his Kaiki sibling. If you are a real enthusiast for American art, you may even have heard of his artist father or his artist sisters. But it is the quiet scientist, Nathaniel, who has had the biggest impact on the planet. Nathaniel Wyeth used to call himself the unknown one, to mark out his obscurity in comparison with his famous artist family. He spent most of his adult life as a research scientist drawn in a multinational chemical company. <laughs> and in doing that he changed all our lives. You can spend your whole life in contented ignorance of his family's paintings. But you will assuredly see uncountable numbers of Nathaniel's contribution to modern life. For a while the Beatles were recording Sgt. Pepper in 1967, Nathaniel Wyatt was wondering whether fizzy drinks could be carried around in lightweight containers. It took him a few years in a DuPont lab to get the design and chemical formula right, but by 1973 he had invented and patented the plastic bottle. Nathaniel Wyatt retired soon after, having given the world a sort of freedom point and how we loved it. One of the characteristics of modern life is how much of it is lived on the move. Shall I grab as a couple of coffees? Fragezeichen apostroph a colleague shouts, before returning with a disposable container which magically doesn't leak. If you have time for them, lunches are eaten in cars, supper is a sandwich on a train. Plastic bottles, plastic tops and linings to coffee cups and plastic wrappings on food make life livable. Last year alone, we used more than 13 billion plastic bottles in Britain. There is nothing inherently wrong with synthetic plastic. When the Victorian scientist Alexander Parks invented the first man-made plastic he wasn't setting out to make a killing machine, like his fellow resident of South Norwood Cemetery, Hiram Maxim, creator of the machine gun. But we have somehow turned this useful substance into a blight on the planet which is doing far more damage than machine guns ever did. Once upon a time, plastic was full of promise. It was cheap and light and could be made into just about any shape. It was waterproof and protected food from contamination. In the early days, it was even seen as an instrument of female liberation because women no longer needed some senior male to live things for them. How did it all go wrong? It didn't happen by chance. We made it go wrong, because we're stupid and idle and thoughtless.
It's too easy to blame manufacturers of sweet, fizzy drinks for the problem. For sure, we should all do something to persuade the dimwits at drink companies to think of containers that won't trouble our great grandchildren. If Coca-Cola is part of the problem, it's unlikely to be part of the solution. But litter isn't their problem. It's ours. It is not the manufacturers who chuck the empty bottles onto the roadside. It is us. Someone you know is almost certainly an anti-social job. It's reckoned that over half of Britain's plastic bottles end up being recycled. Which means that nearly half of them are not. Billions of plastic bottles are, therefore, being tipped into the ground, burned, or left to contaminate the countryside. Think back to the places you loved as a child, fields, hills, rivers or parks. If you experienced them before Dr. Wyeth made his discovery in the 60s, you probably recall them looking much the same as they had for generations. Perhaps for centuries. Today, unless you are lucky enough to have a conscientious local authority or team of litter volunteers, the place you fondly remember is likely to be strewn with rubbish. Beauty spots have an odd effect on some people, causing them to create ugliness. Weirdly, Homo sapiens seems to have developed an urge to foul his own nest. We have all seen the photos of dogs, cats, turtles suffering pain or starvation after being snared or poisoned by waste plastics, weather bottles, jars fishing nets or even, sometimes, fibers of plastic so small that they are virtually invisible to the human eye. We may not kill them intentionally, yet as a species we do it anyway. Plastic on the ground gets washed into watercourses and then rivers, and from there into the sea. Those plastic bottles along the TD line at your favorite beach could have come from more or less anywhere. In fact, last year, a male investigation, headline dustbin of the world, revealed that plastic items washed up on a Cornish beach had come from as far afield as North Korea and Florida. Not only that, one toy plastic ship discovered in the Arctic recently started life in a British cereal packet in 1958, proof, if proof were needed, that plastic is designed to be well nigh indestructible. That's why areas like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, an enormous expanse of ocean roughly twice the size of France, survives from year to year, with rubbish washing from one side of the ocean to the other. And that is just what we can see. Plastic pollution is now so widespread that, as Frank Kelly, Professor of Environmental Health at King's College, London, revealed in the mail only a few months ago, we are now all breathing in microscopic particles of plastic, with no idea of what they may be doing to us.
environmentalists often sound like their own worst enemies, because they have spent so long crying wolf that one might as well grind their sandals to dust and mold them into earplugs. So what if they predict, as they do, that within 30 years there will be a greater volume of plastic in the sea than there will be fish? Perhaps we are right, but we cannot comprehend it, simply because we have never before had to live with detritus that goes on more or less forever. As a mere citizen, it reduces you to a feeling of utter powerlessness. If you bought a packet of peanuts in the 60s, they came in a paper bag. Now, the BAG is coated with plastic. Manufacturers have chosen to do it for understandable reasons, it keeps the peanuts inside dry and clean. But the plastic remains virtually indestructible, and we seem to have no choice in that. If we have a sudden craving for peanuts, our grandchildren will be living with the container long after we are providing food for worms. <laughs> the snack we enjoyed was gone in minutes. We didn't buy the packet as some sort of legacy gift, but the wrapping it came in will be there for decades. And it is not just self-righteous environmentalists and shapeless jumpers who predict Armageddon. Common sense tells us that if every year increasing quantities of this toxic material and applying the belt the place, then sooner or later it will engulf us. There is trouble ahead. We cannot do anything about the plastic bags which litter the deserts of the Middle East or the bottles, drain pipes and jars that float down the Yangtze River in China. But I can do something about the garbage that is piling up at the sides of British highways. I can begin by not adding to it. The other day, walking half a mile on a country lane six miles from the nearest town, he picked up four plastic bottles, two McDonald's wrappers, two fish and chip shop styrofoam trays, six chocolate wrappers, three cigarette packets, two plastic hubcaps, the back of a mobile phone, assorted bits of unidentifiable junk and a plastic doll sleek. Doubtless, there was some story attached to each of the items. Collectively, they tell no story beyond the contamination of the countryside. We have all seen maroons throwing trash from their cars. Why do they do it? Presumably, they do it because they don't want it in their cars. But they are too stupid to understand that jettisoning it from their vehicle merely means that it becomes a problem for everyone, and that everyone includes them. We live in a beautiful country and we have all probably done something to disfigure it. We are lucky that nature is forgiving. Punkt, but the strange contradiction of plastic is that while most of it is intended for temporary use, it can live on for centuries.
research has established that if you allow litter to accumulate, not only does it cost us all our fortune to remove, but it affects our behavior. Our litter strewn environment makes depression more likely. And when our place is mucky, crime and antisocial behavior get worse, as if those with bad intent are uneasy in places which are cared for. If you think about all this long enough, you could get awfully depressed. But we have not yet reached a point of no return. We don't have to live like this. We can still make a start on clearing it up. It is abundantly clear that the only thing that will achieve a lasting improvement is behavioral change. Once upon a time, people thought nothing of having one for the road and driving home legless. We need a similar change of attitudes in this case, so that the idea of dropping litter, and especially plastic litter, would never enter people's hearts. Before we can do that, we need to recognize the seriousness of the problem, which is rooted in the fact that some people use don't see litter. Above all, though, we need to tackle the problem of plastic. We can all make our difference. We could start till next time we have a coffee by refusing any single use plastic container. And we have to start making our noise. Someone, are you listening, Michael Gaffer? needs to take responsibility for the unglamorous job of cleaning up this place. There is virtually no evidence that the government takes litter seriously. Highways England has a statutory duty to keep highways clear of litter. It isn't doing so, but there is no sign that any minister is prepared to lift a finger. How many times have you seen a waste lorry driving along, as bits of rubbish fly out of the back? It happens every week. Fifty years ago, this problem did not exist. It's outrageous. Are we really content to live like this? Jeremy Paxman is patron of Clean Up Britain.